Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show. This is Tony and today's guest is Carla Butard. And this show covers prayer and spiritual warfare. And at the end of the show, Carla prays a powerful prayer for our listeners. And so I highly recommend that you listen right through to the end and say amen to the prayer that is prayed. So I hope you enjoy this interview. We welcome Carla Butard to the A Minute to Midnight show. This is the first time you've been on the show, Carla. It is really good to be able to talk to you and have you on here today. So welcome. Thank you. It's an honor to be on. Thank you for having me. It's our our pleasure. So for those of our listeners who may not be familiar with who you are, can you give them a bit of a background into who you are and what you do? Okay. Well, I'm really just a very ordinary woman. I've been married for, my husband and I will be married 41 years tomorrow, actually. And um, we have three grown children and three children, uh, three grandchildren. And I just uh, began to, after I got saved in 19. 19- 77 and it was um, an awesome salvation experience and um, when I found out that that he was real you know I mean I had known talked about known about Jesus all my life but did not know him on a personal level until 1977 and it involved um, really being delivered from uh, fear um, because I was facing a, a surgery. And so when I found out that he heard my prayer and he answered, um, that was just the beginning. And uh, my husband always says, are you going to tell everybody that? And I said, anybody who will listen. And so God knew that when he captured me, that um, he had a spokesman in the world to tell people about Jesus and the wonderful things that he does. And so I began to teach um, Sunday school in church when in like the early 1980s. And from there, it has just mushroomed. And um, I started teaching at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp. Uh, There are eight camps or seven or eight camps a year. So I am there, started teaching in 2004. Um, And then started being on different radio shows, Omega Man, Weekend Vigilante. Um, I was on Daniel Ott once. I don't think I was um, his cup of tea for his audience. And so (laughs) um, uh, also uh, Pine Ridge Warriors and just, you know, different radio shows have picked up. And so the word is going out uh, over the world and as the years have gone by, um, the Lord has really begun to put me um, out there as a teacher of bringing people into the understanding of deliverance, the casting out of demons, uh, warfare. I've, I've learned that, you know, uh, warfare is a very necessary part of a person's Christian life because, after all, if you don't factor in the enemy, you think everything is from God, and um, we need to learn how to war in the spirit realm because we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. So uh, spiritual warfare is something that is near and dear to my heart, and I, I, it's kind of funny that he would bring me into that realm of ministry because I've always been kind of a gentle soul and didn't know anything about fighting but I've had a crash course and I've become quite a fighter (laughs) for God anyway. (laughs) And um, yeah, you mentioned the weekend weekend vigilante show, which is of course, Mm -hmm. Sheila Zielinski. And Mm -hmm. I believe you've recently co-authored a book with Sheila Zielinski and it's titled Power, Prayer, Warfare That Works. So um, that's a pretty powerful team, the two of you, because Sheila's a bit of a dynamo. So can you tell us a little bit about the book? Yes. Well, actually, um, when when I was first on her radio show um, a couple of times, and then uh, she wanted to come and meet me. And so we uh, prayed and 
we the Lord reminded me that my brother has a beach cabin on the Gulf of Mexico. And so we met there last year in September for the first time, met in person and just we are just kindred spirits um, uh, on different ends of the spectrum, though, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're an unlikely pair, but, but very much in common. And I just love her. I mean, we've formed such a friendship, a strong friendship. But when we were together, uh, we were talking about uh, people that email us for prayer and call us for prayer and... Uh, you know, I would pray for the person or type out a prayer for them and send it over the internet. And they would always say, oh, that was so beautiful. Did you read that out of something? And we just really realized that um, in general, we didn't think people really knew how to pray. Mm. And um, especially in warfare, because prayer is, is different from warfare, I mean, there's been many, 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 many books written on prayer, um, but it took me a while even to learn that that there is another level of prayer, and that is uh, warfare. And I didn't know that until hell came to my house. And so um, we, we began to compare our life stories, and we had so much in common, and both of us really had to be trained by the Lord when when that time came. And so we just decided to, um, well, actually, she said, we need to write a book on prayer, on warfare. And I said, yeah, that would be neat. Well, I, I never knew she really meant it, but here we have this book. And so it came out, um, I think August 25th was the actual release date. And uh, we're having a little bit of some problems, you know, getting it out there. And of course, that doesn't surprise me because of the the uh, the subject of the book. You know, the any there's been so much opposition just trying to get it done. And um, so now it's it's available. But Sheila just sent me a, a text a while ago and said uh, Amazon is you can get it on Amazon, but in Canada, it says currently unavailable. So I don't know what's going on there. Um, but, you know, I think maybe that it's like having a new baby. You know, there's going to be things that pop up that you weren't expecting. And we'll uh, get together and bind the enemy over all of that. And so that's that's why we wrote that book, because we find that that people are asking God to do things that God has given us the power and authority to do. But people are afraid to step out into that. And so that's why we wrote the book. It's, you know, the prayers, it's just to give you an idea of how you can pray, addressing the enemy, binding the enemy, casting out spirits, and and that sort of thing. I wondered um, what was happening with the people that were like proofreading the book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I know it was probably foreign to them, but here they are reading these prayers, and it would be interesting to know. Just, I'm sure it did stir up some some demons. So, okay. do you really think we as Christians, for the most part, really understand the power of prayer and just how effective faith filled prayer is? I think that we as Christians have not scratched the surface of the power that is within us through Jesus Christ um, to move mountains. Mm. I don't think we've scratched the surface. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I would say you're probably right there. And when, you know, when do we need to move beyond con, uh, conversational prayers with God and into spiritual warfare? So how, perhaps, can you explain what the difference between warfare and just normal prayer and conversing with God is? Sure. This is how it happened for me. Um, I mentioned when hell came to our house. Um, at that time, let's see, it was 97, okay, 20 years I had been a Christian, strong prayer life, great faith. And then um, when our middle son turned 16, he decided to go into rebellion. Now, that caused 
a, a real upheaval in our home. I mean, it, it's like our house was turned upside down for a while. I didn't, it was like the spiritual rug that I had stood on all my life was jerked out from under me because up until that time, life was good. Life was successful. Life was peaceful. Life was joyful. Um, all of that. But Whenever that rebellion came into our house, um, first of all, what it it did in me, I, I got scared. I, I panicked because, wait a minute, how how is this happening? You know, the word says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. But, hey, he's departed. How did that happen? Why did that happen? And what do I do about it? So, actually, my prayers became like fearful prayers, you know, Lord, oh God, my son, you know, I would just was crying out to God every day. And uh, one day, and of course, I'd been a student of the Bible for 20 years. But one day, the Lord said to me, why are you coming to me with this? Now, that was shocking. Yeah, I, I was like, well, Lord, who else is there? And he said, did I say to you that if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, that you would ask me to move your mountains? No. <laughs> well, I thought about it. Mm. Whoa. No, I think it says if I have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, the word says that ye, who is me, yeah, ye shall say to the mountain. And then when I was remembering that scripture, I was reminded of Moses. When he had his back to the Red Sea, the people were freaking out because now the Pharaoh is fast approaching. And Moses is saying, fear not, fear not. Today you will see the hand of the Lord. And, you know, he's going on and on. And God said, and this is in Exodus 14, if anybody wants to look it up. But he says, he interrupts Moses in verse 15. It says, and the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Same thing he said to me. You know, the Holy Spirit will bring up scripture when you need it. It will remind you of what you need to know. It, and then he says, um, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward, but lift up thy rod. Now that stuck. I went and looked up that scripture when God reminded me of it. But lift up thy rod. God had given Moses that rod to perform miracles with. And see, he has also given us a rod of authority, and it is the name of Jesus. Yes. That is our, our rod of authority. And then he took me to Ezekiel 37, and I read that and began to learn from what he taught Ezekiel when he was in the valley of the dry bones. And he says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, well, Lord, you, you know, you should know. And it says in Ezekiel 37, 4, it says, again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So he's teaching Ezekiel how to speak to an impossible situation. Moses' possible, impossible situation was the Red Sea. Um, Ezekiel's impossible, seemingly impossible situation was the Valley of Dry Bones. My impossible situation was that my son was going into re rebelling against God, rebelling against authority, rebelling against Mike and me, my husband, Mike and me. And so um, in that story, he showed me how you begin to speak. So he did what God said. And as he did it, things begin to happen. And so that's one of the areas prophesying. You know, it says that in the last days that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh and my sons and daughters shall prophesy. And and I I think that's one thing that we lack. You know, we think prophesying is just 
another person's life th- about their future and what have you. But actually, prophesy means to speak with inspiration your desired end. So if we speak over a situation, and how many times I have said, Lord, And here's a biblical example of that. You know, when Abraham sent his servant to find a wife for Isaac? Yes, yeah. Well, the servant, when he got to the gates of the city, he stopped and he prayed. Now, the servant didn't have a relationship with God, but the way he said it was, I pray to the God of my master, Abraham. Yeah. Because Abraham had a relationship with God, and the servant knew it. Yeah. And so he said, let it be like this. Let let the women come out to get water, and the one that says to me, I will draw water for you, and I'll also water your camels. It says, right after that, it said, and before he was finished speaking, she came out. Yes. Rebecca came out. And how many times I have had that happen in my life as I have looked at the scripture and see how they, it, taking the instruction from God, like God to Ezekiel and God to Moses and God to Abraham, he caused Abraham to begin to prophesy when he changed his name from Abram to Abraham. Abram kept kept uh, confronting God about this seed that he had been promised. And God, after three or four times of Abraham, Abram doing that, he said, all right, today you will no longer be called Abram, but Abraham, which means the father of a multitude. And so um, Abraham had to start saying, I am a father of a multitude, basically, by saying his name. He's prophesying over his own self. And so what I learned was that prayer, I had to change the way I prayed. I was asking God to do everything. Here's another scripture that God showed me at the same time. Unto, it's Ephesians 3.20. Unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. That's usually where we stop. But the rest of that is according to to the power that worketh within us. See, we have power in us, and we fail to use it. People are afraid sometimes to pray forcefully because, I mean, I've had people tell me, um, you're not supposed to tell God what to do. But I said, well, let me just give you one of the scriptures that he taught me whenever I was learning to pray, was Ephesians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. Our request. Yeah. So people are constantly asking me, well, would it be wrong for me to pray this way or would it be wrong for me to pray that way? I said, listen to me. If he said to make your request known to him, how can your request be wrong? True. If it's wrong, James says that you have not because you ask amiss. If you ask amiss, he's not going to do it anyway. So what's the problem? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And so... You know, I I just find that our perception of God and how he is going to look at us, people are afraid sometimes to pray and and be bold with God. But it says he, he actually wants us to act like Jesus. It says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, we after we get saved, sometimes people say, well, I don't know what my destiny is. I said, well, let me help you out with it. First step after you get saved, he wants you to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. Jesus was our example, and he, we are to be brothers that come after the firstborn, brothers and sisters of Christ, 
but he also wants us to not to be to be like Jesus. He it doesn't intimidate God for us to have the faith that Jesus had. It says clearly Jesus said that if those who believe on me the works that I do shall he do also. So why why would we be afraid to step out and do the works that Jesus did? Yeah, that's a good point because we don't really see it um, happening in the Western world, in the Western church very much. I think that's going to change, you know, as we go towards, you know, more of an Acts chapter 2 type yes. type church. And so I think we're going to see great power, uh, but with the persecution, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. you know, that'll be oh, the yeah. downside. Yeah, well, you know, I always tell people, yeah, we don't have a problem praying like Paul prayed, that we might know him and the power of his resurrection. But how many of us pray the second part and the fellowship of his suffering? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, nobody wants to suffer. No. But, you know, Jesus suffered. Jesus was persecuted against. Jesus was, they wanted to kill him everywhere he went. They they told Jesus that he was crazy, that you've got a demon. Um they called him the devil, mm. that he was using the power of Beelzebub. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all there. But, you know, um, oh, one thing, about five years ago, God put a knowing in me. I, I heard it in the spirit that, that the kingdom, the warfare between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness is intensifying. And we are going to start seeing things we've never seen before. And we're going to start hearing about things that we've never heard about before. And so I know that that we are approaching those times. Yeah. But also one thing that just this year, the beginning of this year, um, I've always prayed for the gifts that are in 1 Corinthians 12. You know, Father... You know, this day, give me words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, the gift of healings, the working of miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, and the discerning of spirits. And and as I've prayed for those, I always just kind of skim over the working of miracles. But this year, the Lord has begun to bring that to the forefront. That is one of the gifts that He puts in us, that he gives to us, is the workings of miracles. And I have really become a lot more bold whenever I pray, because I am expecting, I mean, if Jesus Christ is in me, he worked miracles, Yeah. then yes. we should be working miracles as well. Yeah, that's that's true. We can be afraid because people are afraid that what if it doesn't work? You know, if I pray and make a fool of myself because I don't, yes. see, you know, that we all have that that bit of fear at times. But I, I think the thing is too that you, often you, you'll know God will prompt you, and you'll have this something inside that bubbles up to go. You just know when you have to pray a certain way, and you've got to, Absolutely. You, you know, you'd be disobedient to that point if you don't. And so you know, at, but but when it's when it's you don't have that, and you're in a situation where you think, oh, could I pray for that person? You know, should I or shouldn't I? It gets a little bit scary, and I think most times we don't, or or we won't pray in the full believing, faith filled prayer. I, I know that's you know an experience for me. Anyway. Yes, I, I experienced that in the beginning. You know, like I said, um, I experienced a healing. And so it was um, It was my desire for people to be healed. And then God began to pray for people, you know, and, and, I, and miracles were, people were being healed. It was so exciting. But, but then there would be those religious people that would say to me, well, it's, it's, a, it's a religious spirit, actually, that would say these things to me like, well, did you did you do that in the flesh or did you do that in the spirit? And I'd be like, well, gosh, I don't know, <laughs> you yeah. know, in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and I would say, I'd leave that person and say, Lord, what did I go in the spirit or did I go in the flesh? I don't know. I don't know how to determine that. So I would look in the scripture. Let me see. Let me see what Jesus did. And he showed me the scripture where it says, 
he had compassion on them mm. and he prayed for them. Yeah. And so I knew that God put a compassion in me for that person. And, and it's like you said, it was to the point where I couldn't not go. Yeah. You know, that, that prompting was there and that unction. And it was just something that I had to do so that that would leave me alone, you know, that I would obey. Yeah. And um, it was just very exciting. Mm. So what about the role of fasting in, in all this? I mean, we, we kind of go, oh, fasting, that's hard work, and, you know, you kind of balk at the idea, but there must be a role for fasting in prayer and, and warfare and that too. Have you got any Absolutely. thoughts on where that fits? Well, I, you know, I've learned that when you deny the flesh, the spirit is heightened. And so, you know, in the in this situation where um, the man brought his son who would have seizures, in the Bible it called him a lunatic. He was lunatic. Yeah. And, uh, of course, they changed the word to epileptic in the margin. Uh, but he was having seizures. And, um, you know, the, the father brought the boy to the disciples and— um, they couldn't cast it out. So Jesus says to the disciples, oh, faithless ones, you know, how long will I be with you? Bring the boy to me. And so he, when it says that when the, when the boy was approaching Jesus, the demon threw the boy down and he began to wallow and foam at the mouth. And Jesus cast the spirit out of the boy. Okay, then he it says that this kind cometh out not but by fasting and prayer. It says um, in Matthew 17, 20, when the disciples couldn't cast him out, Jesus said, be, the, the disciples said, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, move from here to yonder place, and it shall move, and nothing shall be impossible. How be it, this kind goeth not out except by prayer and fasting. And most people believe that Jesus is referring to the particular demon that was in this boy, that they needed to fast before, by prayer and fasting, before they could cast that demon out. But what Jesus is actually addressing in them is their unbelief. The unbelief will not go out, but by fasting and prayer. Okay, that's really interesting. I hadn't ever thought of it like that. But yeah, that's a very good point. He is talking about their unbelief. And let me see where that says. It's in Mark nine fourteen. Let me see how it how he says it there. It's also... Um, he addresses their unbelief. It was their unbelief. And you know what? I have come to believe since um, I've been dealing with demons. Um, Mark 9, 14. That was in the wrong place. Okay. Okay. In Mark chapter 9, it says it like this. Um the father spoke to the disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. In verse 19, he answereth him and saith, this is Jesus, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I endure you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wild foaming. Okay, let's see. Over in, then in verse 29, is he's talking about their unbelief again. And it says, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So he, he is addressing the unbelief in the disciples. But because it's connected to this story, everybody thinks that it, it means that this you, they should have fasted and prayed before they could cast out this demon. But the truth of the matter is, is we should live a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. I mean, if somebody comes to you with a need, 
You shouldn't have to say, well, let me fast and pray for several days and then I'll be strong enough to do it. We, we should be fasted and prayed up all the time. Yeah. And uh, here's another thing, like since I've been doing deliverance or casting out demons, sometimes the pers- the demon in the person will manifest in a way that causes the person to be surprised. And when the disciples tried to cast that demon out and that boy fell down and started wallowing and foaming at the mouth, it scared them. Yeah. And they didn't think they could do it. So they backed off. That's what I really think happened. And so, but that's why Jesus was talking about their unbelief. Yeah. Why, you know, if, if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, do you know how little bit that is? That's a little bit of faith. Yeah. But I believe that they backed off. And so, you know, that, but it is kind of hard. I mean, I have seen some manifestations. <laughs> yeah. And if you're not focused, it can throw you off balance and cause you to back away from it. Mm. So, have you got any personal experiences that you can talk about where you've seen results from prayer and spiritual warfare? Well, yes. Um, well, I'll give you the very first time that I. Um, entered into like a warfare thing, but it was just through a prayer. Um, I had suffered a depression. Um, I had three babies in three years and a, a major back surgery all in about a span of five years. And so um, I don't think that's what caused the depression. I just, we That runs in our family. It's a generationally inherited curse of depression. Okay, so um, I was healed of depression. My daughter, when she was five years old, she was our youngest. She was a melancholy child. And when uh, and she had like separation anxiety. Uh, Whenever she started kindergarten, I would drive her and her brothers to school and there would be big tears coming down her face. And. I felt helpless because I, first of all, didn't know what was making her cry, and she didn't know what was making her cry. So I felt helpless as a mother because I couldn't help her. And so I had begun to ask God about it. Well, one day after I dropped her off at school, I had Christian radio on, and there was um, an interview on a radio show. And they were talking about spirits that could be transformed. Baby, sorry, that broke uterine. up again. Uh, transferred was it? Um, that word broke up. A spirits that can be transferred from a mother to a, a baby in utero. And he said, for instance, let's say a mother uh, was suffering a depression when she was pregnant. Now that was an answer to me from God because I had been asking God to help me with this. So here it is right here. He said, if a mother is pregnant uh, and she is experiencing depression, then those spirits transfer from the mother to the baby. Spirits of oppression, grief, sorrow, sadness. You know, he started naming all these things. And I thought, me, 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 me. (laughs) And so the other guy said, So what should a mother do if there's someone listening that has this going on? He said, well, you simply go when your child is asleep in the bed. You go to the bedroom door. You don't have to speak very loudly because spirits have supernatural hearing. And all of those spirits around depression are evil spirits. Yep. And Jesus has given us the power to cast out evil spirits with his name. So you go to your bedroom door, your child is sleeping quietly, and you just say to your to the spirit in the child, you just say, you spirit that is causing my child to be this, 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 and this, and you list whatever it is, and you command them to get out in the name of Jesus Christ. And I thought, well, gosh, that doesn't sound very difficult. Mm-hmm. And this was, you know, this was before I knew anything about demons or warfare. I was just in that 20 years of a good, solid Christian woman that knew how to pray. Okay. So 
I did that. I went to her bedroom door and I said, every spirit that came into her through me when I was pregnant with her, oppression, depression, sadness, sorrow, loneliness, all the things that I knew I was suffering. I said, get out of her in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, the next morning, we're getting ready for school. And I had devotions with my children every morning. And so during the devotion time, it was um, it was about receiving Jesus as your Savior. Well, she was five years old. Now, both of her brothers had already accepted Jesus. And she stopped and she said, have I accepted Jesus as my Savior? And I said, well, probably not if you're having to ask. And so I explained to her well, she wanted to accept Jesus as her Savior. So I led her through the prayer for that. We drive to school, no tears. She never cried again. Wow. And I thought to myself, wow, there is something in that. Yes. Speaking to the thing and commanding it to get out in the name of Jesus. Because I'm telling you, she cried every single day. She never cried again going to school. She didn't have separation anxiety anymore. I mean, it was just amazing. So that was my very first experience with simply using the name of Jesus that he's given us to cast out devils. Mm, That's very good. Excellent. Um, So there's... Well, there's a couple of areas in particular, I think, with me that are close to home personally, where having the right uh, approach to seeking God and seeing answers are important in the area of financial provision. How mm-hmm. do you see prayer fitting in with these two issues? How should people deal with those when taking them to prayer? Well, I usually share with them an awesome revelation that God gave me when my husband and I were in financial straits. My husband opened his own business. Uh, In fact, it was the same year that my son went into rebellion. So we had just opened this business. The first year was successful, very successful. The second year when my son went into rebellion, um, we were hit from all sides. It was just it was just unbelievable, the the opposition. And, you know, looking back, I remember when we built our house and, and uh, it was finished and the kids went to school and Mike went to work and I was outside on the porch with my Bible and my coffee, having my prayer time. And it was a gorgeous January day, not a cloud in the sky, but suddenly a darkness fell over our land. It was, you know, how when the sun goes between I mean, a cloud goes between the sun and you, immediately a darkness happens because the shadow is there. But there was no clouds, but it was a darkness. I look back and I know that that was the enemy's way of letting me know, I know where you are and I'm going to be in your life. You know, I'm fixing to do some trouble. Yeah. So, I mean, we, the IRS had seized our our property, our bank account. I mean, I'm telling you, it was fierce. Well, God gave me a vision, an open vision one day because I was, I was bombarding the gates of heaven because, Lord, your word says that if we bring our tithes into the storehouse, that you would open the windows of blessing and pour out so much that we can't even receive it. But I'm telling you, we are tithers, and it is like the devil is consuming us. What is, you know, what do I do? Well, you know that little song, I went to the enemy's camp and took back what he stole from me? Yep, yep. Okay, well, we sing that at Lake Hamilton all the time. And I stopped one day singing that song, and I just said, Lord, who do I know that um, ever went to the enemy's camp? Is there really an enemy's camp? And if there is, how do we get there? I've never known anybody that got their stuff back that Satan stole. And I'm here to tell you that across the board as Christians, we have been stolen from. The enemy has stolen and stolen and stolen. So um, in the the book of um, 
James 5, verse 4. It's talking about um, a, um, a, a, an unjust boss. And it says that um, in verse 4, it says, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them who have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Now, that the Lord showed me that in July of 2000. And um, I got so excited when I heard that scripture, but I really didn't understand why. But it's saying that the money that was held back from you by fraud, it's been stolen from you or it's been held back from you. It says that it's crying. You know, money has a voice. Our possessions have a voice, just like in um, Genesis where uh, God says to Cain, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the grave, from the ground. Blood has a voice. In another place in the Bible, it talks about the beams of wood, the timber cries out. You know, we don't really Mm. see all of that or understand it. So I had this vision of me getting separated from my daughter in a department store. What do we do? The child begins to cry, mommy, mommy. And the mother is crying out the child's name. The cries of those two bring them together. So when we get in financial trouble, What I did, I began to cry out for those things that had been taken from us by Satan. And I had a vision and the windows of blessing were wide open and God was pouring out blessings to his people. And Satan, there was a big demon right under the windows and he was catching all these blessings and funneling them over left and below the windows of blessing was the enemy's camp. And it, it's like a big junkyard, only it's not junk. It was it was promotions. It was husbands or wives or children or houses or, um, you know, payroll, just whatever. And um, when I saw that, and Satan was standing outside the gate, picking his teeth and laughing us to scorn. Because he's been stealing from God's people forever, and we we have never known what to do about it. So when I saw that, I just said, no way, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I bind you, rebuke you, and render you powerless. I command you now, in the name of Jesus Christ, to loose everything that you have stolen from Mike and me, from our children, even from my mother and daddy, and their ancestors. I command you to loose everything that's been stolen from us, and I send out the harvesting angels to bring it into our household. And the word says... That when the thief is discovered, you must repay double. Job was repaid double. Mm. So I'm calling in the double. And I am not kidding you. You would not believe the things that began to happen. Wow. We've been restored and restored and restored. And you know what? I shared this testimony on Sheila Zelensky's show. Yeah, I remember hearing it. There was a man in Sacramento that heard it. He began to use that principle. And it said it revolutionized his financial status. So, so yeah, that's amazing. Um, can you, because our time is getting short, I was thinking perhaps if you could um, tell our, the listeners where they can find you online and actually it would be really great if you could then maybe close out by praying for our listeners that are in those very situations that you're talking about. Okay. Okay. Are you talking about the financial? Yeah, yeah, and anything okay. else that comes to your mind. But that, yeah. But so okay. first of all, where where can they find you online? Okay, I have a website. It's CarlaButod dot com, and that's C A R L A B is in boy, U T is in Tom, A U D is in dog dot com. That's my website. Um, my Email address is the Carla Butod at gmail.com. Yeah, that's great. 
and I'll put um, I'll put a link in the video underneath this too if people need to see it written. Okay. So okay. that'll be yeah, that that'll be great. And I'd um, Thank you. would encourage people to go and visit your site and listen to uh, you know some of your broadcasts, including that one you were talking about with Sheila that day. Yeah. Uh, that was a really powerful one. So it's yeah. going to the enemy's camp. That's what it's called. Great. The yes. enemy's camp. Yeah, excellent. So, yeah, maybe if you could pray then for our listeners. Um, okay. That would be really amazing. Okay. Well, Father, right now, I, I thank you for the privilege to pray for your people. Um, I bring my brothers and sisters in Christ to you, those who have been stolen from, those whose lives have been ravaged, their finances have been ravaged, their children's lives have been ravaged. Perhaps their health has been ravaged. It doesn't, anything that causes lack and loss is from the enemy. And so, Father, I bring them right now before your throne. And we, I bring them to the enemy's camp, the one that you showed me, the one where all the blessings that we've missed out on uh, have been funneled and stolen by Satan himself, and he has those in his enemy's camp. We come to the enemy's camp right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And Satan, we bind you. We know that you are the thief. You come not but to kill, steal, and destroy. So we come now, and we bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. We command you right now to loose everything that you have stolen from me, from my brothers and sisters in Christ. We command you to loose them now in the name of Jesus. And we send out the harvesting angels right now to go and retrieve, just like King David went and got back his wife, his his wives, his children, and all their stuff, it says. And so, Father, we're doing the same thing right now with the enemy's camp. And we call it into our households in Jesus' name. Not only what's been stolen from us, but Everything that's been stolen, even from our parents and our ancestors, all the way back to Adam and Eve, those blessings that belong to us, whether they're spiritual, physical, mental, uh, emotional, we call them into our households right now in Jesus' name. And I send a mighty angel and to remove that angel that is standing under the windows of blessing and blocking God's blessings from his people. We command you to move, get out of the way in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you. You know, we know it's not about the stuff, but Lord, you you desire to bless us. You desire us to be prosperous and and healthy and happy and joyful and having more than enough that we might bless others with it. And so, Father, we just give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory for the things that you are going to do. This is the day for the working of miracles, and we thank you for that. We, We thank you right now, Father. We just thank you. We bless you. We bless you. And I bless your people today, Father, in Jesus' name. I look forward to hearing awesome testimonies as they begin to go to the enemy's camp to get back what's been stolen. In wow. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That was a powerful Amen. prayer. That was that was really awesome. And um, I've thoroughly enjoyed having you on today. Thank you. And um, Thank you. yeah, it would be really great to have you come back again at some point. Um, well, you just let me know when. Yes, yeah, so thank you heaps. Um, I'm sure our listeners are going to get a lot out of that, and that prayer was <clears throat> was powerful. So um, it's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. And the name of the book again is Power Prayers: Warfare That Works. Well, thank you so much, Tony. Yes, ah, thank you too, Carla. That was, that was really amazing. Well, folks, remember that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly realms. And those powers have their feet on the ground in the form of some humans which serve their master, Satan. And I have to say that having heard Carla share some stuff that they've had uh, difficulties with that book, all I can say is it rings true that that's the case because it must be one powerful book. And I suggest that people should get their hands on it if at all possible. 
Also, please visit minutetomidnight.com. We put all our articles and shows on there, and we've had some powerful new articles on there recently, so check them out. And there is a donation button on the website, and we really uh, are very appreciative when people do donate to us because the only way we keep this going is through donations. And I write all the music and play and record it all. Anything that you find in our show is me playing and you can find my music at rockshawsounds.com and there is a link to that on the Minute to Midnight website. We also have a Facebook group which is largely run by Brooke and she does an amazing job there so we would love to have you join our Facebook group as well. Well, I think that's about it for this episode and thank you for listening and we will catch you in the next show.